So our next presenter is Paul Mark Di Francesco, who is a PhD student at Queen's University. His research focuses on the observation of rockfall occurrence through the monitoring of rock slopes adjacent to railways using terrestrial laser scanning as part of the Canadian Railway Ground Hazard Research Program. His research focuses on the development uh, to developing better practices for the semi-automated detection of rockfalls and the 3D computation of their properties. Welcome, Paul Mark. Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, Looks so, good. Yeah, today I'm going to be uh, presenting on behalf of uh, myself, David Bonneau, and Gene Hutchinson um, on digital rockfall databases and using LIDAR to observe rockfall activity um, in three dimensions. And the particular data set we're working with is from uh, as part of the Railway Ground Hazard Research Program, where we've had one of the longest records of of LIDAR monitoring with seven years of, of rockfall um, occurrence that has been monitored. Uh, so yeah, so I'll first give you guys an overview of um, what we'll be talking about. So I'll introduce rock slope instability and why rockfall databases are useful. Uh, we'll talk about sort of the opportunity for 3D geospatial databases for, um, you know, uh, helping to solve some of these issues with, with uh, using this information. And then we'll look at the methodology of how we extract rockfall from LIDAR and 3D. And we'll observe seven years of data. And then we'll try about some applications of these inventories and some future work that, that is possible with them. Great. So uh, mountainous terrain presents rock slope instability hazards, and the smallest of which are rockfall. And that's particularly what my research has been focused on. And uh, here we're seeing the site, which uh, I focus on in this study, uh, which is the White Canyon along the Thompson River in British Columbia, close to Lytton. And uh, it's a rather complex site and managing all the rock slope instabilities here can be a challenge and using remote sensing to observe them um, is, is a very handy tool. And so managing hazards rely on people in the field, people in the office, all working together to coordinate operations. And this often involves the sharing and communication of spatial information in various formats, which could be uh, things like mileage, reports, uh, things, GIS data sets, and other formats as well. And so what Rockfall databases allow us to do is first we can analyze a spatial temporal distribution of failures. Uh, and we can start to understand some sort of zones where we might want to um, further prioritize or, or monitor more closely in order to mitigate hazards and, and mitigate risk. Uh, we can quantify rockfall hazard and we can quantify uh, risk uh, by understanding how the rockfall magnitude frequency relation is. And lastly, we can learn to uh, occur, learn why rockfall occurs based on rockfall inventories and we can start to understand some of their triggering factors uh, as well as perhaps in the changing climate, we might be able to understand how the rockfall activity might change within the future. And a big part of this work is that in complex or large scale environments, compiling rock slope and stability information is a challenge. There is visibility limitation from inspector and line of sight. Um, rock fragments can be indiscernible from the remainder of fragments that are collected in ditches, as we can see here. Um, uh, and fragments of rockfall are potentially dispersed, too small to observe at inspection viewpoints, and they could have also propagated beyond our line of sight. And this is showing some examples of this along the White Canyon in, in British Columbia, where when we're looking up at the slope from track, we're getting a much different perspective on some of these features than we are from across the river. Uh, the other thing is that data formats and storage are also an issue. How do we share our reports and findings? How are individuals or teams going to be interacting with our data? And how do we preserve this information for when experts and prior and new members join our teams? And my point with this is that going digital can solve many of these, this, these issues and can give you data that can last forever in uh, a distributable format that can be really useful for practitioners to use in uh, mitigating hazard and mitigating risk. And so LIDAR provides us the ability to digitize terrain at a particular instance in time. And using a series of 3D algorithms, we can observe rockfall occurrence throughout um, multi-temporal data sets. And so here you're seeing 
a LIDAR scan along the Fraser River um, of a CN Ashcroft mile 109. And uh, here we're digitizing with this laser scanner a 3D points that describe the, the terrain uh, ge geometry at a particular instance in time. And this is showing you what one of these scans look like. And this is for the White Canyon, where from our line of sight across the river, we have a much um, better vantage of the slope. And uh, we can monitor information, uh, which if we were at track level, we might not be able to see. And so the site that we studied uh, is a White Canyon, and it's located in interior British Columbia, Canada. And it's made of two sections, White Canyon West and White Canyon East, and it's separated by a tunnel. Uh, and we have here, we have 11 total scan positions uh, for the east and western portions. Uh, and we have segmented these in further into their own sections, and then we merge them to process all the data together. And here is showing you all the dates of how much we've scanned this site over the years, and the particular data that uh, I'm using in this study. Here we're showing you what the 3D rock ball extraction workflow looks like. You calculate change, you uh, lump the change together from uh, front surfaces and back surfaces. You can cluster individual objects together, and then we can segment these into individual objects and we can analyze their individual properties of one another. And each of these point clouds represents a rock fall, which we have known to occur between some time one and some time two. And we, if we look at a little more complex example of what this workflow looks like, it really relies on a series of, of, of stages uh, that can all impact each other. And so you need to register your data sets so they're in the same coordinate system, compute the change between them. Uh, you need to classify their change, cluster them together. You might want to use uh, geological models to classify the types of rock falls that are, that are occurring. Um, we classify their shape as well as compute their volumes. And all these properties go into uh, a rock fall database. No? We can all see this video. I don't know if this is blocking your screen. And so as an aside, here are some of the, uh, some of the advancements we've made. We've looked at how changing your change detection algorithm parameters can alter the change detection signature that you're getting and how this may impact your eventual rock fall inventory. And we've realized that uh, having a, a more detailed change detection signature really can preserve the geometry and small rock falls that are detected. We've also looked at how volume calculations can impact frequency magnitude relations and how that might in the end impact um, a quantitative risk analysis or a quantitative hazard analysis. And so we've tried all these different reconstruction algorithms to compute the most accurate volume in three dimensions uh, and tag those on to the uh, rockfall properties in their database. And so here is showing uh, our, our final results for White Canyon West. And so we had uh, monitored the site from this, for this data set from April 15th of 2013 to March 2nd of 2020, which was a total of 52 change detection intervals. And we observed 22,611 rockfalls with a total volume accumulating to uh, 5,521 cubic meters. And keep in mind that rockfall exhibits a magnitude frequency relation. So the majority of these failures are on the lower end of, of this range, as we'll see in a later slide once I show you those relations. So here, uh, projected onto a photogrammetry model, we have each 3D rockfall that's been projected and colorized based on its volume. So cooler colors are corresponding to smaller rockfall volumes, and warmer colors are, are corresponding to the larger volumes. Uh, and here I have a few insets, which on the next slide we'll look into further. We can see just how detailed this data set is. And so here are insets. Here's A on top, top left, uh, B on the top right, and then C and D on the bottom as well. And we can see just how much information we're having. And in this particular instance, we're projecting the most recent rockfalls on top of each other. So this event here, a 2,600 cubic meter event, has had some uh, activity following it. And some of these rockfalls are projected on top of this object. For the eastern portion of the canyon, uh, we monitored it from May 26th of 2013 to March 2nd of 2020. 
for a total of 49 change detection intervals with 27,775 rock falls detected and a slightly less uh, volume of uh, 1,993 cubic meters, ranging from 0 0.001 to 47 cubic meters. And again, here we have um, different sections showing about just how detailed this information is. And we can see up into the upper reaches of the slope, and we can monitor how these could be impacting uh, channels and filling channels, as well as we can monitor very detailed the uh, rockfall activity just adjacent to the track. Uh, and so here's a fly through that's showing this data again in 3D. And it's projected onto a photogrammetry model. And same thing goes, all the rockfalls are uh, measured from low volumes of cool colors to greater volumes of warm colors. And uh, from this data, just looking at this, we can really conclude that uh, it really gets rid of some of these visibility issues with rockfall currents. And we can get a much better measurements of rockfall activity along uh, transportation corridors. As well, 3D, 3D data offers an enhanced visualization and user interaction with the data. Um, this rock slope in particular is, is very geometrically complex. And so having 3D data lets you look at the data at a whole nother kind of perspective. Um, as well, we have this long-term storage of this data in a standardized, standardized format, which can preserve its usage across generations. And now I'll talk about some of the applications of digital rockfall inventories. So the first being um, frequency estimate for quantitative hazard or quantitative risk analysis. On the right-hand side, you're seeing uh, a frequency magnitude curve for each of the different sites. And um, compiling this data together, we can start to get an understanding of the, the return rate of certain um, magnitudes of rockfall. And we can input these into our uh, hazard and frequency or and risk uh, quantitative analysis strategies and figure out um, which areas along a slope or along a corridor we want to prioritize with mitigation efforts. For future work in this system, I outlined earlier the um, complex array of different steps that you need to do of 3D algorithms in order to in extract this information. And a really big part of that is um, accurately classifying your, uh, your rock slope in order so that you can separate callus movements from soil movements from rock slope movements. And so this is a really big um, area where we need to put a little more effort um, for being able to automatically classify rock falls. Um, and so what we discovered is that each step in this process is really important for guaranteeing a high quality end result. And so um, it really requires us to, to think well, um, within uh, an engineering mindset and a geological engineering mindset, what the best strategy is to get uh, reliable rockfall information in the most automated fashion possible and where it's best to have human interaction in this automated system. And so here are showing some um, newer automated classification methodologies, which can segment um, 3D uh, slope models into their classes. And we can start to use these better way. For other future work um, in, into this digital rockfall database realm is, is understanding the factors that influence the progressive failure of rock mass. So we've been able to digitize all this information and now it's really going back to thinking about why these processes are occurring um, and at all of our different uh, geological sites and thinking about um, how progressive failure of the rock mass, if we understand it better, will we be able, to be able to forecast events in the future? The other one is considering spatial temporal distribution for 3D probabilistic rockfall simulation. So if we know the exact 3D location of rockfalls, we can really have an enhanced input to 3D models um, that will help us better quantify hazard and risk. Um, lastly, doing some more um, investigation on the portability and distribution of data. So it's in a more widely accessible format and understanding how new visualization and interaction methods can help us um, fully harness this data set. So maybe we're going to look at augmented reality or virtual reality to um, allow for um, teamwork teams to, to work on this data simultaneously. And yeah, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Gene Hutchinson, David Bonneau, and Rob Harrop, as well as the Queen's Geo Geomechanics Lab, the Canadian Railway Ground Hazard Research Program, as well as NSERC. Uh, here are my references, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions.
And I'll just leave this fly through going on in the background if there's time. Yeah, there should be time for one question if someone wants to ask it. I just want to say thanks for that presentation and beautiful data visualization that you guys uh, prepared. Thank you. Uh, we'll wait off to see if anyone comes through with a question for you here. Well, it's looking like you're off the hook. So we're going <laughs> to move on to our next presentation here. Thanks so much, uh, Palmer. Great. Well, thank you.